It is unpleasant to confront the countless newspaper articles telling of murders, abuse, oppression, and violence that happen so close to us. But this collection is important precisely because so much of what it contains is unpleasant. Welcome back. Next, a story about an area heroine, a woman who took on a tremendous amount of risk to document a series of heinous crimes. Her name is Esther Chavez Cano, and thanks to a partnership with New Mexico State University, her story and her amazing efforts to help women in her hometown of Ciudad Juarez will be forever preserved. It's not a new story, but remains a tragic and largely unsolved one. It was the topic of this documentary produced in 2002 by Lourdes Portillo. I came to Juarez to track down ghosts and to listen to the mystery that surrounds them. It was the reason for this display of 400 pink crosses and dresses at New Mexico State University two years ago. It's referred to as the femicide, and it involves the violent deaths of hundreds of women since 1993 across the border in Ciudad Juarez, most of the cases unsolved. The victims were mainly young women between 17 and 22 years old. Many were students. Most worked in maquiladoras or twin plants. Many were newcomers to Juarez who had recently arrived from other parts of Mexico. The victims were usually reported missing by their families with their bodies found days or months later abandoned in vacant lots. In most cases, there were signs of sexual violence, abuse, torture, even mutilation. Um, I came here in, in mid-1998 for CNN. I was a correspondent with the investigative unit. But this is also a story about heroic people who, despite the odds, were determined to tell the story of the Juarez femicides and also try to bring them to an end. One of them was Brian Barger. Um, my boss had handed me a small clipping from the New York Times, um, which reported the death of Sagrario Flores, um, the daughter of Paola Flores and um, sister of Juana Flores, who are sitting right back here. Um, I did some checking, made some phone calls. There had been very little in the US press about this. Um, I came down to Juarez and within a couple of days met Esther. He met Esther Chavez Cano, the woman being honored at this ceremony at New Mexico State University. And she turned out to be an amazing source. Um, she knew everybody. She had been involved in women's rights issues um, seemingly forever. I didn't have a very good sense of it at the, po at the time, but she seemed to literally know everybody in Juarez, in, the in Chihuahua, in the state capital, and in Mexico City. And so I would, uh, at the end of the day, I'd be thinking, well, gee, I should go check over here. And I would call her, and she'd have the person's phone number. And she was just a, a great source and a great guide. And, and Chavez was, without a doubt, the go-to source for information about the killings in Juarez, because Esther alone had made it her business to stay on top of this story, about which so little was known. One day she invited me over to her house and she said, I want to show you something. And took me into her office and started pulling out these boxes and boxes and boxes of newspaper clippings. And it turned out that Esther was the only person who was systematically keeping records of all of the women who were being killed. It was phenomenal. Phenomenal? because many Juarez newspapers at the time didn't bother to archive the information or pictures about the murders. So Chavez took it upon herself to keep track of what was happening. Since at least 1990, when she began to see the changes happening in her city, the growing violence against women, children, and men, and the interlocking crises of uncontrolled growth in a city with no economic and social infrastructure for the people, she has worked tirelessly to document crimes that in many cases have never been solved 
and have essentially disappeared from the justice system as completely as the young lives were disappeared from the streets of Juarez. Thanks to this ceremony was then more than just about honoring Esther Chavez Cano. It also celebrated the donation of the Esther Chavez Cano papers to the NMSU Library's Rio Grande Historical Collections. It's a work that documents not only the Juarez murders, but 14 years of human rights activism in that city. I was a doctoral student at the time studying in Arizona, and I came uh, to do an interview. Adriana Candia, who at the time was a journalist uh, from Juarez, uh, had taken me to, to meet Esther. And it was NMSU's Cynthia Bejarano who first contacted the NMSU library about preserving the Chavez archive. I believe it was last summer that I received a call, or I had called Esther, where she was asking me, what do you think about me donating this collection to New Mexico State University? It had been years and years that um, there had been some strong efforts here at the university to raise awareness around the murders. Entonces nos reuníamos. One of those involved in the effort, Greg Bloom, was also at the ceremony honoring Chavez. When he first met Esther, he was investigating the Juarez murders for an NMSU magazine. From the very beginning, Esther has been one of the few people that I could always depend on in Juarez. Um, we were trying to get our feet on the ground there. She always gave us wonderful advice, um, never steered us wrong. Sometimes she would uh, say, you know, you might want to watch out for this group of people or this person. There might be issues there. Well, you know, I would just think, well, they seem like a good person to me. You'd start working with them and you'd get burned. It's been very difficult to uh, progress um, in Juarez. The activists were inspired by Chavez to raise money and organize protests. Uh, from the beginning, Esther was always present when things were a little sketchy, uh, when things feel, felt quite dangerous to be present at protests, at movements. She was always there offering the guidance and the leadership role uh, to fight for issues of justice for women and to fight against violence against women. The group of activists even joined this woman, who you met earlier, Paula Flores, the founder of a group called Voces Sin Echo, and whose daughter, Sagrario, was murdered in the search for the remains of other victims. You know, I was out there and I found a, a, a spinal column, and, you know, just as among us as volunteers, we had to take a guess if that was a, you know, human or animal. We decided it was animal, we left it there. Uh, the family found some, some bones, looked like wrist bones. Um, there were no police there. So, so what do we have to do? What they do? They took it to the police station. The next day in the newspaper, it came out that, well, they were dog, the, the bones of, uh, of a dog. But uh, the, the prosecutor, who should have been out there in the field looking into these crimes, investigating them, said, you know, had they been human bones, she would have arrested the family and all the volunteers for interfering in a crime scene. Okay? That's the kind of attention you get in wires from the police. You know, this is a town without police, with police that are corrupt, that, that will often uh, threaten um, activists, that will... Um, that, that murdered one of the lawyers of, of, of the scapegoats that were tortured into confessing to these, to these crimes. Uh, that's still where things are today. Undia. And remember the CNN journalist, Brian Barger? He was so impressed with the work of Chavez that he decided to stay on in Juarez to help. I called my boss in Washington after being here about a week and um, um, it told him that I'd like to recuse myself from reporting on this story because I would, wanted to become involved uh, in doing something um, about the situation here. And he thought I was crazy and tried to talk me out of it. Um, but I told him that this is something I really wanted to do, that I had been spending years and years and years parachuting into places and covering tragedies um, of all sorts. Uh, and then picking up and going to the next one. And this one, I somehow, for some reason, wanted it to be different and wanted to stay. So I eventually quit my job and um, helped uh, Esther create Casa Amiga. The Casa Amiga Crisis Center. Chavez had, years earlier, established a group called Ocho de Marzo to pressure the Chihuahua government to protect the rights of women. But Casa Amiga was the first organization in the region to provide shelter, counseling, and legal services to victims of violence. The idea was that while we weren't able to do anything to um, help women who'd been killed, we might be able to do something to help um, uh, women who are still living and uh, make a difference in the lives of people in a city where um, sexual assault uh, and sexual violence 
and domestic violence was so prevalent. Our mission is to transform the structures of power between men and women. The results are truly astonishing. And to this date, our intervention programs, psychological, legal, and medical, have attended 96,670 people. And in the services of prevention, we have over 244,540 persons served. Chavez blames the problems in Juarez on many things, including the North American Free Trade Agreement, which she says closed many local businesses and left millions of Mexicans in extreme poverty. I got to see firsthand the um, devastation that is caused by maquiladoras to work in families, uh, especially when uh, families are dependent on uh, very few dollars a week. And the aftermath of the indifference of that industry toward forcing governments to uh, behave properly in their neighborhoods and to the workers and to the citizens. And the drug cartels, Chavez says, infiltrated the highest levels of government and business, inducing young people to join criminal gangs rather than work in low-paid jobs at maquiladoras. There does not exist uh, appropriate policies in, in our country to, uh, to give us security, um, much less preventing the crime. Generally, the government actions are just punishments. They do not attend to the official corruption, and because of that, impunity increases, and also the uh, lack of confidence in, in the authorities just grows and grows amongst the ordinary people. In the United States, there is a mandate that, that uh, 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 victims uh, are mandated uh, by the police department, by the sheriff, to assist those victims' rights. And it's in a state legislature. Mexico, there's nothing like that. So it's very, very hard to, for uh, organizations like Casa Amiga and Esther Chavez to, uh, uh, to participate and to, and to keep on working and working and working compared to the United States where it's easier for nonprofits that are doing victims' work to exist. It's very, very hard for Casa Amiga to do that. In fact, those who supported Chavez say Mexican officials hindered her efforts time and again. Uh, there have been months where all the, peri uh, all the newspapers in Juarez will um, uh, gang up and start spreading lies against the stair and other activist groups in Juarez uh, to discredit them and you know, find more reasons to you know, explain why these crimes have been solved. Sweep it under the rug, and a stair is always hung, hung in there, uh, despite all these attacks. La tarea no ha sido fácil. This has not been easy work. We have uh, managed to uh, confront uh, campaigns against us uh, to try to uh, uh, put our work down, uh, the work of uh, people who are jealous of the work that we do, and all kinds of, of difficulties that have been waged against us. Her work with women's rights organizations, Casa Amiga, which she helped establish, and now her papers, preserved at the NMSU library, will carry on her legacy. A collection that includes a huge series of clippings from Juarez newspapers beginning in 1993 about the Juarez murders. It also encompasses the efforts of international organizations that work to raise awareness of the murders and the social and economic conditions in the city at the time. And the collection touches on other matters like factory conditions, women's rights, and the politics of activist groups. Working in archives may seem by some as dry or boring, but in going through the records people leave behind or consciously gather together, we catch glimpses of the range of human nature and experience. We see the complexity of life and are often brought face to face with things we would rather not think about. It is unpleasant to confront the countless newspaper articles telling of murders, abuse, oppression, and violence that happen so close to us. But this collection is important precisely because so much of what it contains is unpleasant. Besides the human tendency to shrink from unpleasant things, there has always been additional pressure by some to erase or suppress evidence of things that they may find embarrassing. 
It is an honor to us to be trusted with this collection and to help keep the stories of the women of Juarez from fading into comfortable ignorance or being silenced. The archives are going to be a, a tremendous uh, assistance to uh, individuals that like to do research on what's happening in the border area. Uh, and we know very well there are institutions that would like to hide what's taking place. There are institutions that don't enjoy the fact that Casamiga exists and that, says that, that, that uh, Esther Chavez is out there speaking in behalf of the victims. There is organizations that don't enjoy that. Uh, and I'm very happy for the university to, to uh, and for Esther Chavez for both to come together and, uh, in this endeavor because those archives will be open for thousands and thousands of people in uh, years to come. Because of Esther's extraordinary efforts, a documentary record exists. The lives that are lost can never disappear into silence because journalists, activists, historians, librarians, archivists, even Hollywood filmmakers, we will all be able to examine this record. And if we choose to keep our eyes open, we can get a little closer to the truth. La custodia de estos documentos the custody of these documents will enable the really horrifying memory of the unjust death of children and women simply because they are children and women. And perhaps uh, for those who read these documents, new generations will find the way that will find a way for the uh, for half of the world to respect the other half. Now, housing the Chavez Collection at the NMSU Library will not only make it accessible to researchers and activists in the U.S., Mexican activists have also called for help from U.S. agents to solve the Juarez murders. And the documents will be available to the general public as well, so that everyone can know more about what happened. And that's all we have for this week. If you have any comment about the show, call us at 646-2818 or send an email to aggiealmanac at yahoo.com. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Gary Wirth. Thanks for watching.